Hello, everyone, and welcome to Accelerating the Development of RNA LMP Therapeutics. I'm Shell Ip, Client Learning and Scientific Content Manager. I'm delighted to be moderating another exciting panel discussion for Precision Nanosystems. Uh, I'll start with a, a warm welcome and thank you to our panel of experts. Uh, and uh, for this discussion, we'll be dividing it into four main topics. We'll start with uh, a topic of screening ionizable lipids and lipid mixes. Then we'll move on to uh, optimization of fit for purpose lipid compositions. And, and then we'll move on to scaling lipid and LMP formulations. And finally, we'll close off by discussing some of the regulatory considerations. Uh, we'll start our introductions with uh, Dr. Anita Thomas. She's the Director of uh, Delivery R&D here at Precision Nanosystems. Dr. Thomas joined uh, Precision Nanosystems in 2013 and currently leads the delivery program efforts here. She's an expert on next generation approaches for nanomedicine development in the areas of vaccines, non-viral cell therapies, and uh, genomic medicines. Prior to Precision Nano, uh, she worked at the Center for Drug Research and Development here in Vancouver, developing advanced drug delivery systems for the treatment of various diseases. And prior to that, she was a CIHR postdoctoral fellow at the BC Cancer Agency, developing lipid-based drug delivery systems. Welcome, Anita. Uh, and next, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Mark Tracy, CEO of Tracy Bioconsulting. Dr. Tracy has played a key role in the advancement of nine programs into the clinic, including several that were commercialized. He has played important roles in the development of technology platforms and product pipelines for Alkermes and Alnylam Incorporated, two leading biotechnology companies where he's worked for over 20 years in various leadership roles. At Alkermes, he played a key role in building the company's parental product development capabilities. And as a member of that team, he developed the first sustained delivery system for proteins approved by the FDA. At Alnylam, he, success he successfully brought to the clinic new nanotechnology-based products that enable human clinical proof of concept for RNAi uh, and a growing pipeline of clinical programs. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Uh, next, a uh, big thank you to Dr. Nicholas uh, Valiante, founder, CSO, and president of Innovac Therapeutics for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Valiante is a vaccine industry thought leader with deep experience in all aspects of vaccine design, development, and clinical testing. He has advanced vaccines and therapeutics to the clinic, targeting infectious diseases, cancer, allergy, autoimmunity, and aging. At Chiron, Novartis, and GSK, Dr. Valiente rose to the level of global head of immunology and immunotherapy, where he pioneered mRNA vaccines as vaccines and therapeutics. In 2015, he joined Moderna Therapeutics during their hyper growth phase and built a personalized cancer vaccine platform. Welcome, Nick. And finally, a big welcome to Dr. Andy Gale, Chief Development Officer at Replicate Bioscience. Dr. Gale has over 20 years of experience in development of drug delivery systems and is a pioneer in the field of mRNA vaccines and nucleic acid delivery. He's an inventor of 41, on 41 patent families and over 500 applications and over uh, 200 issued patents in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, prior to joining Replicate, Dr. Gale was the Chief Scientific Officer here at Precision Nanosystems, where he focused on the creation of transformative nanoparticle medicines using proprietary LMP delivery systems and microfluidic formulation platform. Uh, previously, as Vice President of Formulations in Analytics and Chemistry at Avidity Bioscience, he pioneered the development of their antibody oligonucleotide conjugate delivery platform and helped raise over $100 million in venture capital, ultimately taking the company public in June 2020. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. Thank you for all the panel. Uh, please uh, come online with your cameras, and uh, we'll start with uh, the first topic here, uh, which is uh, the uh, the screening section of uh, ionizable lipids. So we'll probably start off with uh, an easy question here, uh, but uh, what are some of the key considerations when selecting an ionizable lipid or an LMP formulation? Um, why don't we let uh, Anitra start? Okay. So, yeah, when it comes to ionizable lipids, so sorry, um, the, quest um, the question is around ionizable lipid and LMP composition, right? So, first, uh, the foremost uh, ingredient that we have to select is the ionizable lipid. And with the ionizable lipid, we can actually work on the PKA. It has to be in the effective PKA range to be active. And then uh, there are four, 
three other components in the LNP, which all have its role, its uh, important role in the delivery aspects, uptake as well as the endosomal release. Um, so uh, we have to carefully select these components and the compositions and the NYP ratio. Everything will relate to to efficacy, safety, scalability, and stability. So um, I would say actually we have to start with the, the target product profile in mind. And when we start with the tar target product profile, the the efficacy readouts and the safety readouts that we are choosing should be, um, you know, reflective of the target product profile that we wanted. And then you could actually screen the ionizable lipids with respect to these parameters that we have talked about. And also keep in mind that it's just not the ionizable lipid and the LNP parameters that we have to think about. We also probably have to think about the, the scalability and the manufacturability of these formulations, but this can be actually talked about in the next sessions after. I'll add from a non-specialist, so I'm an immunologist and uh, basically been in the vaccine industry for 25, more than 25 years now. Um, we actually look uh, a lot at uh, the functional readouts first. Uh, in vaccines, you kind of go empirically, and then you know that if you get a really good antibody response, which is an easy thing to measure in animals, that you're getting all that stuff, right? Um, that you're getting the uh, entry into the cells and the escape from the endosome and enough antigen expression uh, to lead to uh, a good response. Then we go into the details. So it's a little bit reversed in the vaccine industry. Uh, and then for us right now, uh, we haven't seen a lot of differentiation in terms of immunogenicity, and I've screened uh, my teams, my immunology teams, have screened uh, LMPs at Novartis vaccines as well as Moderna. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of differentiation in terms of they all seem to work pretty well, but some are better than others. Uh, it's really for us right now more in the in lines with stability and scalability, formulability, uh, picking novel lipids. So that's a different perspective uh, than than getting into the molecular aspects. I wonder if anybody else on the panel has a a different view. Well, I, I would agree. I think I think generally the first thing that people think about when in terms of screening is how do they work kind of in vivo from a sort of efficacy and safety perspective. I think it's probably worth pointing out that um, you know lipids gain different pedigrees over time. You know, in terms of how far they've gone down the pike, so to speak. So and and in what way they've gone down, you know, are they, have they been used systemically? I mean, because dose matters, right, for all these things. So have they been used systemically? In what uh, in what applications? How far along the clinic? We'll talk about the regulatory path. Have they gone? So you know, you know, so you got to kind of think a, a lot. I think about how you know, kind of what your goal is in um, short term and longer term. You know, in terms of the ionized liquid that'll help you sort of screen and pick ones or rapid to clinic might be a different choice than, you know, wanting to optimize for uh, delivery to another tissue or something like that. But I think the ultimate kind of screen is still considered to be an in vivo one. So, yep. Yeah, if I can make a comment, I know a lot of people on the, the you know, the the webinar today will be thinking, you know, we've got this new concept. It's usually a biological idea. We have no idea about, uh, you know, non-viral delivery, LMPs. What do we do? Where do we go? I mean, and the first choice you have in that small company is, do we build it ourselves or do we outsource it? And, you know, I'm, I, we had that choice back in 2020 and we chose to outsource. We decided not to hire a bunch of medicinal chemists, formulation people, and begin. It's a two to three year journey of discovery to, to mine that field. We wanted to accelerate our cargo quickly and rapidly. And so we look for a partner. Obviously, I'm biased. I've, I've been CSO at Precision Nanosystems. I've been on the scientific advisory board for five years. I am no longer either. I am independent and I'm a customer. You know, so I'm using PNI, and why did we choose them? Because they offered a diverse ionizable cationic library. It's early, absolutely, but that means the, there are um, advantages in terms of licensing and pricing. 
Mm -hmm. um, but they also offer the formulation side and an end-to-end -end service. So, so they can do all of the preclinical work, the scale up for you and take it forward and you can focus on your biology and your in vivo testing and accelerate your program forward. We began uh, Replica back in early 2020 uh, with some ideas, three scientists in a, uh, an incubator lab in San Diego. We filed our IP in that first year around our novel self-replicating vectors. We are now about to file an IND with the FDA for an infectious disease vaccine. It's in the public domain. We partner with Precision Nanosystems one of the reasons we were able to accelerate is they provided that expertise to us and scaled us quickly and took us forward. Um, the library is early, absolutely, but they have supporting documentation. They've done the early genotox testing. They have safety testing on one of their lipids. They've scaled it, it's available GMP. So for us, it met that criteria of, we don't have to build this internally. We can focus on the things that we're good at, rely on, PNI's expertise. Now, PNI are not the only people out there. We've probably heard a lot about Acuitas. Absolutely, you could go to Acuitas and use them. They'll provide you a license structure that you can use and take forward, but they're not going to provide the kind of support PNI does. And we've been very yep. happy uh, with the acceleration that we've I seen agree. using. Andy, we, we, we made it. Yeah. Andy, we made a very similar choice, you know, make a make, make yeah. body. Um, we do have a organic chemist in, in the group that's outsourcing some work for longer term uh, exploratory yep. stuff to accelerate our clinical programs, uh, because one of the things that happened after the COVID uh, vaccines uh, on the mRNA platform with LNP, and as well as now just recently the personalized cancer vaccines, similar, exactly the same, exactly the same formulation, really just changed the sequence in the middle. Uh, basically, it's been a revolution in the vaccine industry. And, and when I was talking about launching Innovac uh, uh, back in you know, 2021, 2022, we launched in 2023, uh, it, the goal was not to make lipids, not even to make RNA, the goal was to make vaccines because mRNA is an enabling technology for so many vaccines that I've dreamed about for years. And the process is so much faster. And really in the future, I believe it's gonna become plug and play to regulators. We're gonna to get to that later, but it's gonna look very, very similar. One of the things Andy was screening uh, and going outside and, and rather than trying to make something from scratch, is in my experience, we started, Andy and I both started Novartis Vaccines in 2016, working on mRNA vaccines and LNPs. Uh, and my team is the immunology end, and we screened a lot of things in vivo and different animals and different rodents and even large animals. And then when I went to Moderna, there was a lot of screening going on as well, which I oversaw in different ways, although I was busy with the personalized cancer vaccine effort. Uh, I've never seen anything too toxic. Right. Anything like overtly toxic in, in terms of these uh, molecules, I've never seen anything in terms of like genotox, reprotox, et cetera, uh, in vitro, in vivo kinds of studies. They look quite benign. They have a little bit of immunostimulatory activity, although some of that can be attributed historically to non-clean RNA. But overall, I think, you know, the idea for smaller companies or academic groups is, you know, you, if you're really in, if you do have an army of organic chemists, then that's a good thing to do. But I actually see these becoming quite fungible in the future. No, I sense. agree. I mean, you can outsource your RNA manufacturing. You can outsource your, you know, drug product on the LMP side. Um, you know, those capabilities are available out there. Maybe, Mark, you want to make a comment. You're providing consultancy advice to many, many startups out there. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a fundamental early question for many. Uh, and because of the uh, various, you know, it's typically like Nick was saying, you know, you're interested in developing an actual pharmaceutical product. You're not interested in developing a, call it a delivery platform for many of these, you know, companies, gene editing and um, mRNA of various applications vaccine. So, so many of these startups and early stage companies kind of come at it from that angle. And, and to the points that were raised, you know, I think, you know, the first one, the first thing that's usually um, kind of focused on is the access it from the outside because of the time, the skill set, the capability to uh, build that's necessary to kind of do it in inside. And, and so that's kind of the way m many grow. I think when, when it tends to be a little bit more shifted to the outside is when you're, you're getting outside of the sweet spot of the technology, that, which is, you know, systemic to liver vaccines, uh, a local vaccine IM kind of thing. When you start 
getting outside of that, then maybe there's more motivation. But yes, you're right. I think most of the companies who are biology and sort of product focused tend to uh, look toward uh, acquiring the technology from, you know, the L&P, the lipid type of technology and some of the services first from the outside. Yeah. Yeah, great summary. I think I think one of the key concerns for anybody that's getting into this space and doesn't have their own LMP library is freedom to operate. Um, our understanding there, I actually worked with a lot of medicinal chemists when I was at Novartis uh, in, in the past, and composition of matter is very crucial. Um, I'd like to get the panel's opinion on something that I believe is that really it's the core that gives you your novel chemical matter, and then the fatty acids off the side can be manipulated in various ways. They're, the core isn't really critical in many ways to how the LMP protects the RNA, gets across the cell membrane, escapes from the endosome. I'd like to get Andy and Mark's and, and Anitha's uh, opinions on, on my very simple-minded view of that. I think the core structure in the middle gives you your novel chemical matter, and then you have the cabbage coming off these sides. <laughs> that's really your, that's the business side. But uh, in, from an IP perspective, that core is where you really say, okay, now that's mine. And it does exactly the same stuff. So that's what I've been seeing also from other uh, uh, potential partners uh, uh, like, that are like precision nanosystems. And also our screening at Novartis and Moderna is similar to that as well. Yeah, so Nick, you know, in terms of patent IP, there's nothing simpler than a structure because you can search a structure and yeah. it's either novel or it's not. And, and, and so for the ionizable lipid, you're right, you just got to find uh, a, a piece of the molecule that's novel, and then you can just build off it. Uh, and, and then, you know, you got to hope that it works, um, yes. you know, and screen it and, and plow, you know, your investments, time and money in to creating that library. Um, what I would say is, there's, and I'm not going to go into it, there's a whole other side of, of IP that isn't that simple in terms of uh, composition with the other lipids, the ratios, you know, uh, particular cargos, that, that is a bit of a minefield, but you know, that IP is starting to mature, it's starting to get old, and I think we'll end up in a place where it's just the ionizable lipid that drives uh, you know, your freedom to operate. But we're not quite there yet. There's still a lot of litigation going on between companies. And historically, that's been going on for a while, but I think it's all going to quieten down eventually. Uh, as they, LMPs are old; it's an old technology, you know, coming out of the Peter Cullis lab in there in Vancouver, close to PNI, back in the late '90s they first began. And I know Mark, you worked with Al Nylum in the early 2000s with Onpatro. Uh, Thank so you. So it's for, not uh... new. Thank you for for exposing my age here. <laughs> but absolutely, uh, you know, it's it's this it's this yin and yang of uh, of of mature and you know from a development perspective, you kind of look at that and go, great, it's vetted, it's known, right? Um, so you know, it just depends. But from an IP perspective, maybe it's aging, you know, getting gray hair or losing hair or whatever it is, um, you know. But uh, but you're right. I mean, I think I think what we're seeing is. Uh, you know, a level of maturity, which is good. I mean, that is why this field is where it's at, frankly, and that maturity has different dimensions. Uh, one of it is experience in the clinic for different applications. That brings larger uh, sort of, you call it, people who aren't sort of living and breathing this stuff every day into the field, which raises, really raises all boats and, and helps to push the technology in newer areas. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing. So that'll create new IP po pockets and opportunities, which some of which are, you know, being explored by folks on the panel here uh, and, and, and that. So, yeah, so I think you're right. I think there are certain phases of the technology which are maturing. That has created the idea that this is a developable uh, kind of uh, technology, uh, and that I think will provide that momentum forward to to push it into these uh, areas that were, uh, you know, it just wasn't kind of ready yet for. And so that's the exciting thing. And, and, and mass, massive amounts of uh, human data, human safety. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Good. Right. After the after the COVID experience, again, different than systemic delivery, but on Nylum, a pioneer of siRNA, you know, we had a big uh, partnership with you guys at Novartis that that dissolved uh, right before you had your success. That was kind of unfortunate. Uh, but basically, uh, the same thing when they got rid of vaccines right before the pandemic. Yeah. So, Nick, that's a, oh, go, go, Nathan. 
No, yeah, yeah. just uh, just to add on actually what you guys have mentioned and to bring up actually the precision's, uh, you know, precision's actually background expertise on this. Like uh, we have a diverse uh, ionis diverse list of ionizable lipids at this moment, like more than 120, very diverse uh, with the varying levels of uh, biodegradability. And, um, you know, we have proprietary IP, proprietary, this is our proprietary lipid form, lipids, and we also have lipid compositions and they are like we are constantly developing novel compositions that are actually much more differentiated uh, than the existing space so you will come to know more about it sooner at the same time we would like to say that actually we already have showcased uh, you know our ionizable lipids activity and safety in vaccine models and also cell therapy gene editing you know gene therapy applications so uh, we also have a you know off the shelf um, you know, T-cell kit that can be used for, you know, you can just order it and then you could actually test in non-viral applications related to cell therapy, uh, either HSC or uh, T-cells. Uh, for the HSC, the kit is actually coming soon. So um, I think uh, even the, you know, we all know actually the LNP landscape is very dynamic in nature, but at the same time, we are monitoring these and we are trying to actually bring out differentiated compositions and uh, novel ionizable lipids that are, that can be used for um, specific indications. So we, we, we take a lot of pride in our work and we try to actually bring, you know, the compositions that may immediately work for you. So you do not have to immediately go on to develop your own platform for a long, you know, long winding road, right? So, but before that, actually, what you can do is you can get some narrowed compositions from us and then try to see actually for your biological model, whether that is actually going to work or not. And then we can iterate from there. Yeah, no, and you guys, uh, you and I also uh, manufactures and, and sells the equipment. Uh, that's very good. We already have an Ignite yeah. and we're getting a scaler, uh, et cetera. So we are pretty happy with the partnership so far. Uh, we have um, one of the things uh, to point out is the car, the car T-cell application is really interesting. I was uh, lucky enough when I was at Novartis to be uh, at the University of Pennsylvania to start the collaboration on CAR-19, uh, Chimera, uh, after the third patient. And I found an old notebook the other day from that day, and I had written Andy, Sam, exclamation point. It was like the All second right. I wrote down because they were doing Lenti, and I was like, this is really great, but if you try to move outside of B cells, you need to be able to turn this stuff off. And uh, the LNA, has, uh, RNA has been, and LNP have been in, in, in my mind for a long time. And I think that's really important. And I'm glad to see that people are starting to look at that question of temporarily turning on those T cells and see if we can gain some pharmacological control. So I think that's a good segue, I think, to a question from the audience. Uh, we're talking here about uh, primarily in vivo stuff and now ex vivo, but uh, there was a question about uh, whether uh, you know in vivo experiments are, are crucial and can in vitro experiments be helpful in the screening phase. I know uh, Nick, you had advocated for sort of jumping directly into vivo. What are your thoughts on this panel? In my, in my view for vaccines, there's nothing better than to look at the, the impact of the immune response in, in small animals. We start with mice, single strain. It's quite high fidelity translation to humans. If you have something that hits the maximum in an animal model uh, that we understand very well, we use benchmarks like recombinant protein plus adjuvant. So if you have an mRNA LNP formulation that is hitting that, it's going to translate to humans quite nicely. I don't believe in efficacy models as much. Andy knows that very well. I don't think they're they're helpful at all. In fact, they send us in the wrong direction. But immunogenicity is quite high fidelity, both for antibodies. And now we know with the personalized cancer vaccine from Moderna for CD8 T cells. So we know when we get antibodies for vaccines so uh, that we get CD4s, so we get helpers. But for CD8s, it's a different, different situation. But the mRNA is very, very special in an LMP formulation. There are ways to QC for sure. I think for LMPs, what we do is a lot of bio, a lot of sort of, sort of biophysics and, and, and biochemistry uh, specifications. And, and the, 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 you know, the specifications are really tight. 
right? There's only a certain, and that size, distribution, right? Uh, N2P ratios, encapsulation, all those things are really uh, very, very clear. Uh, and they sent, when you get a good RNA formulation, they do that. But in my field, no, I don't believe there's a shortcut. When we do make a new RNA, we put it into, you know, in vitro translation, rabbit reticulocyte, we do, you know, HeLa cells, HEC, et cetera. But that's just really to make sure it's not completely dead. But our final, the earliest decision is, is it immunogenic? And then we decide whether, Next is after that, is it is it stable? It's really the most important thing to us. Say to that. Like, is this thing going to break down after one freeze thaw or two freeze thaws and things like that? Yeah, Andy? I mean, certainly, yeah, in the vaccine setting, nobody's really been able to correlate uh, uh, protein expression against right. immunogenicity. It, it's, it's way more complicated than that. It's about the adjuvant effects of the LMP with the RNA inside, how it engages the immune system. And so an in vitro assay isn't going to predict that. It's, it, it could mislead you. It could say, look, this formulation with this RNA, protein expression is higher in cells, therefore it should be better. It, there's no correlation. Maybe for gene therapy, that, was, that could be the case, but it's unlikely the world has played with various forms of nucleic acid, tried to screen in vitro, um, and it hasn't translated. We've always had to go to the in vivo model. Certainly, yeah. I believe that the cell-based systems are good for predicting stability, changes yeah. in, in particle properties, degradation of the RNA, they'll pick all of that up. But uh, that prediction for you know going forward efficacy, it, it's not going to translate very well. Yeah, uh, like as Auntie and Nick has mentioned, it's so cell, you know, cell based work or in vitro based work is actually good for QCing purposes uh, to understand stability or uh, when you are actually working on the antigen platform or the, you know, the, the mRNAs, different mRNAs, you could probably um, use it to select the probably the mRNA or the payload that is required. Um, from our experience, actually, we have seen that unique compositions are needed for different cell types. So basically, by just changing the composition, we can actually um, change the protein expression levels in the, in the cell type. So, but uh, the same thing, you, you cannot just say that actually the same LNP compositions are going to work in the in vivo. So this can be mainly used for qualitative assessment. If things doesn't work in in vitro, okay, they are probably not going to work in vivo. So there is that uh, understanding that you can bring it from having an in vitro potency assay inside the lab, um, you know, just for QC checks. If there is any problem when you are actually manufacturing your payload or things to understand, things like that, but in vivo, in vivo readouts cannot be removed from the equation, yeah. That uh, maybe is related to another question we're getting from uh, the audience here. But the question is, uh, how do we screen ionizable lipids based on N to P ratio? I wonder if, you know, this is the, the forum for in vitro testing uh, where you can rapidly sort of test those things. Uh, again, I would say that in vitro potency assay can be used to screen different uh, formulations and the N by P ratio, but it is not necessary that they are going to translate into in vivo. So the the n by p ratio you may have chosen in the in vitro conditions may not be the n by p ratio that may give you effective biological readout in the in vivo. So please keep that in mind. Again, like a for QZ aspects, stability aspects, um, in vitro uh, in vitro potency is a really good uh, readout, right? And we could use that. Does that answer the question? Mark, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I totally agree with the in vivo. I mean, it, it's, this, these are complicated. They work in a complicated way in the body, whether it's systemically or, um, you know, by for vaccine. And that so far, you know, it, it's kind of almost, yeah, I mean, it's, it, from the idea of selecting a formulation, yeah, I think uh, my experience with many, and working with many clients and my own personal experiences in vivo, in vivo is, is what you have to do. I mean, yeah, there's there are specific questions as was addressed that maybe an in vitro test can specifically answer, but in the context of 
uh, of formulation, uh, uh, screening and picking formulations. I think so, like we were talking about specifications, right? So biochemical, biophysical, uh, just does the RNA translate at all? Because if yeah. you get zero, that's a bad sign. You should tell your team to go back and remake it, figure out what's yeah. wrong with it, sequence it again, et cetera. Something's wrong with the cap, maybe capping, et cetera, all those kinds of questions. Uh, but, you know, so th that can be done as a screen before you go in vivo. But once you have something that, you know, behaves properly, you know, reasonable, the good, better, best argument in vitro is really hard to make. Uh, like I said, if you get a formulation that's too big, that has too poor polydispersity, is crashing out of solution aggregating, right? So that that's, that you, you know, that's not gonna work very well going forward in vivo. But once that formulation of the RNA LMP is really spot on, and like I said, the specs have been known for a very long time, Andy taught me, two decades ago nearly uh what they literally look like and i've seen it a million times every time we make a new one you know they have to fall into that specification then if they do and they look like they're a good candidate and your rna is good you should go straight to your workhorse in vivo model that is your real screen and then you decide which one is the is the winner you know which one are the all surgeons and get get pushed aside some people use the distribution right we use antibodies as our first screen I think that that leads us very naturally into uh, the next topic, the second topic of uh, discussion here, which is optimizing these formulations. Um, and maybe uh, it'd be worthwhile for the panel to just kick us off with some key considerations for optimizing these formulations. Uh, maybe I can start. Uh, you, know, you know, I always take a, an engineering perspective. Uh, you know, how are we gonna make this formulation at scale? You know, rather than build yourself into a corner early on, start thinking early about, OK, I've got to get to phase one, phase two, phase three, a commercial product potentially. What should the process look like? Um, and, and certainly uh, you, you can visualize that now. You know, it's very straightforward. You, you need a lipid mixing process. Um, I remember, you know, I'll give give everyone in the audience a bit of history here. 2006, I worked at Novartis Pharma. I led the RNA, the SI RNA delivery efforts at Novartis, and I interfaced with Mark Tracy, who was across the street at Al Nylon, and we worked on LMPs for two years. 2008, I switched divisions to the vaccine division. That's where I met Nick Valianti. Nick had come across from Chiron, relocated into Cambridge and Boston. And I'm going to give a big shout out to the team at Novartis Vaccines, because we were the first people to actually test an LMP in a vaccine application. We used self-amplifying RNA. We filed a massive patent estate from 2008 to 2012. But in 2012, we published a paper in PNAS where we showed that LMP was the perfect delivery system for an RNA vaccine. Nick is on that paper. I'm on that paper. Uh, and it's very well safe cited. Uh, not as well recognized as it should be, but it's the first example of an LMP. Now, why did we choose LMP? Because it was scalable, and it says that in the paper. We, we did small scale tangential flu, flow filtration. We did sterile filtration. We used inline mixing using a T system and a, a syringe driver. It's all described in the paper. But what we said is this is a, for the first time a scalable liposomal technology that we think can go all the way. And that wasn't our work. That was the work of people like Mark Tracy, Al Nylum, Tech Mura, Peter Cullis. Uh, oh, and, you know, we, we do, and we cite everybody in that paper. Uh, but what we saw was an opportunity for the first time to scale a, a, a complex technology using ethanol dilution. And we knew we could process it at scale. You can't use a dialysis bag, you're going to have to use tangential flow filtration. You've got to do terminal sterilization. You can't be running an aseptic process, uh, you know, at scale. It's, it's got to be a closed contained system where at the end you do a sterile filtration. And so that's why we really started exploring the LMP. Now, there was a lot missing. We didn't have microfluidics. There were a lot of issues to overcome. But fundamentally, we saw this is a process that we think we can scale. And that's why we pursued it. And so for me, that's the first consideration. I develop products. I, I, we're not doing kind of interesting research uh, projects. We're looking to translate things as quickly as we can into the clinic. This 
is a process that can translate. And it was shown, you know, with COVID, it was rapidly scaled and, and up to commercial production quite quickly. I'm not saying it was straightforward. There are always going to be issues, but those issues were solvable by the chemical engineers who, that's what they do. They solve problems. Yeah, very similar to, to what Innovac does. We, as soon as we conceive of a new project and we decide to work on it, we start developing a vaccine from that day. So we start thinking about regulatory hurdles, clinical trials, exactly what we want to do. We don't go as far as the Novartis used to go, Andy, in terms of we have to have the single uh, pre-filled syringe, fully liquid, right? yeah. room temperature table for four years at that stage. But we do start with the idea that we want to have something that's viable in the long run, at least to get us proof of concept in phase one, that we can actually make things and we think about all those problems. Uh, the engineering aspect is really an important part to this whole process. I think a lot of the stuff that that uh, used to be a big mystery, not just on the LMP side, but also on the RNA side, has been sorted out quite, quite clearly uh, with the COVID vaccine uh, and pandemic experience and the mRNA, et cetera. So really it's an engineering problem and an execution problem for most people. So there's enough lipids out there to screen. You have to know what you're screening for. You have to have the right kind of screen, so you pick the right ones. Uh, but in the end, you know, you should be able to use the technology in, with partners like Precision Nanosystems, et cetera, have the equipment if you want to do things in-house. There's certain types of specialty specialized equipment, as Andy mentioned, but these are all well known. How long do we wait for the DLS, Andy, when we were in the virus vaccines? <laughs> that thing is magic. Yeah. No, That's no, I'm... Yeah, lots. Lights scattered, right? I remember we were like, we can't call it an LMP until we get this data. Yeah, no, we, I mean, a lot has changed. The, the world has definitely moved on since. It's, it's uh, one of the major reasons I went to Moderna to do the personalized cancer vaccine, because there was other peptide-based and adeno-based and DNA, and I looked at mRNA because of the experience I had at Novartis, and I said, this is the only platform that can meet the need, and it's pretty good at CD8. Actually, mRNA is really, really good at inducing the killer T cells, which is the mechanism of action of a personalized cancer vaccine. And it really was an engineering question for us. We didn't do a lot of fancy immunology science. We just built an algorithm, predicted the new antigens, and then basically everything was focused on how quickly can we get this made? And we were able to make it in less than 30 days. And the Moderna COVID vaccine went into a vial GMP after the spike protein sequence was released. It was in a vial LMP formulated, ready for human testing in less than 20, 26 days. And the first human volunteer was uh, vaccinated uh, less than 60 days after that. That is- I think, I think these com the comments reason. here- yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead. Um, yeah. I think these comments basically um, kind of bring up the point about where do you want to, you know, if you're thinking about a product or technology, where do you want to take your risk? And in a lot of these cases, folks are, are advancing a, a, bio, a new biology of some type or a new target uh, or a, <clears throat> in, in a new therapeutic area or something like that. So, so there's usually considerable risk in that, you know, and so people try to look for ways to de-risk um, <clears throat> some of the things they don't really want, want to take risk in. And on the delivery and the formulation side is typically in these situations, one of those. And, and as, you know, the panel has pointed out is, um, you know, that's one of the advantages of this you know, technology platform, it, you know, is its maturity in the sense that that the panel is talking about. And and so you're able now uh, to take uh, less risk on that side, you know, to balance off the other uh, portfolio you risk you may be taking on the biology side, for example, or on the on the clinical side. So basically, oh, sorry, how's Sorry. No, I, yeah, so basically, maybe Shil can actually bring out this point as well. So basically, we are talking about uh, doing preclinical studies and the CMC considerations and the regulatory considerations, almost thinking almost simultaneously so that it can be accelerated faster. Yeah, right after we get our antibody titers, we do some side things, T cells, et cetera, a couple other things going on. We go straight to rat pretox. It looks like a toxicology study, just not jail. So it's pretty, it's like I said, it's a pretty linear path. Um, and, and as Mark points out, the biology, like what's your biological question? That's usually where the risk is. Or there's heavy competition if there's very low risk, right? <laughs> if yeah. the biology is sorted out, then you're gonna have a lot of competition. You wanna move quicker. On this topic, there seem to be a lot of questions um, from the audience about uh, sort of optimizing compositions. I know we're, we're sort of veering into, uh, let's just stick to a composition and uh, try and de-risk that. but. Um, there's some questions, for example, about, you know, what are the critical characteristics of the ionizable lipid that could lead to better stability? 
uh, and questions about how changing the other aspects of the formulation could impact uh, stability, particle size, et cetera. Maybe I'll have a, a bit of a chat about that. Maybe Anita. That's, is a good that's out of my uh, space, so I'll, I'll just relax. Okay. Somebody else take this one. Yeah, I think it's a Anita question, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so stability studies, I think you need to conduct the stability study. So basically, um, I would say that uh, once you narrow down the compositions that are efficacious, and um, you could uh, you have to start the stability studies and understand them, whether they are actually going to be stable while you are actually making it in the GMP conditions, uh, or also like you need to have at least a minimum six months stability. So start monitoring the critical quality attributes, have an in vitro potency assay to kind of actually check it out whether that is possible. And if it is a completely novel biology, um, I would also probably say that the stability studies in parallel with a small animal study readout. Um, it's, uh, if it is an established platform like vaccines and things like that right now, then you may not, you can actually probably go with the in vitro potency model for establishing sta stability as well. Yeah, yeah self-assembly is the key thing. Um, that gives out the stability. So we have to think about the drug product stability as well as how well the, the nucleic acid is protected within this uh, LNP. So uh, consider actually adding analytics along with that and um, having a partner, a true partner who is very collaborative, working with you on your, uh, you know, the drug substance and the drug product, having the expertise on the drug substance and the drug product, um, knowing all the details will really help here and having the infrastructure for the analytics. So for example, we have brought in a lot of analytics actually that is required for the, the nucleic acid uh, LNP ma manufacturing workflow and for the CMC considerations. Yeah. Great. Yeah, there's supposedly a magic ratio, but you can deviate a little bit, but I don't think for, of the helper lipids and, and N to P, et cetera. There's like a you know sweet spot for most of these. Uh, the stability question is really important, right? So that that would be an improvement in the technology that would go a, a long way for everybody. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any theories or hypotheses around that today. I don't know if anybody, if, if we did, I'm not sure we want to share with that. <laughs> Yeah, stability will be kind of a, you know, compacting effect with respect to the drug substance, the, you know, the structure of these ionizable lipids and the helper lipids and the other, you know, the other ingredients that uh, one is using, depending on the application, right? Because for vaccines and protein replacement and gene editing, people may go with the different uh, compositions, um, you know. Some of the lipids and the compositions will work in every case, but always we have this tendency to actually improve on finding the, the compositions that work 10 times better than the other compositions and wanting to actually get the stability data with respect to that, that, uh, that desire to improve always will be there, right? Um, yeah, so, and also if we have an improved formulation, that means uh, one can actually decrease the dosing that is required and the manufacturing burden can be decreased as well, right? Yeah. And another sort of related question is, uh, what are some of the analytical methods to assess the stability? If you're looking at uh, characteristics of the, the, the LMPs themselves, or you're also looking at uh, the RNA integrity afterwards, what kind of analytical methods? Should I go with that or? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah, you go. Uh, yeah, I think you guys can actually add on after that. So the typical uh, critical quality attributes everyone is talking about will be size, PDI, encapsulation efficiency. Uh, this is for the general understanding on the, you know, the drug product, right? But um, more in detail, you would like to know about actually how is your novel excipient look like, how is your uh, the different uh, LNP components look like, whether there is any any kind of a degradation happening, is the conditions making it vulnerable, and um, 
with respect to the drug substance, again, there are analyticals that is available. So just by doing a gel electrophoresis will not be the answer that we are looking for. Uh, we may have to do complex studies with, um, you know, capillary electrophoresis, for example, and also MS-based um, identity checks. And uh, is the drug substance um, uh, performance is retained by, for example, if it's mRNA, looking at the capping efficiency, looking at the polyethylene, tail, uh, looking at, um, you know, has there been any degradation that is happening? So, our, I, you know, recently people have been also looking at reverse phase HPLC um, and, um, you know, other uh, ESIMS techniques that has been, you, you know, typically been employed for these purposes. And I think uh, now there is a USP guideline also uh, around mRNA LNP. So basically that also could be an accessory for people to kind of looking at the tools and techniques that is actually required to just start off in the field. And uh, again, collaborating with us, uh, you know, appropriate CRO could help you accelerate this. Excellent. And, uh, you know, I'll just build on what Anith is saying. You know, one of the things you've got to consider is your target product profile. So is this going to be a li liquid, formulation. Um, I'm sorry, I'm being pinged. I'm, is this going to be a, a, a liquid formulation? Uh, uh, you know, and are you looking for stability over one year? Uh, and is your cargo going to degrade? Now, the composition, the, the, the other, the non-ionizable lipid components, the ratio of cholesterol, did you choose DSPC or another co-lipid, the peg lipid, all really matter because the, if, that, if they start to degrade at four to eight degrees, you're going to see it quite quickly. Now, obviously, if you've got a frozen formulation, it's an RNA vaccine, it's frozen down at minus 80. We spent a lot of time at Novartis figuring out how do we thaw that, reconstitute it, and get the same particle back? It what now there's plenty of published work on cryobuffers, uh, but back then there wasn't. And it took us a while to figure out what was the the what sugars did we need in there to maintain that particle property during freeze thaw. So there's a, a lot comes down to where are you going? Is it, what's the cargo in there? How stable is your cargo? And how are you going to expose your lipids to degradation pathways? Those degradation pathways are known. You know, they the, the, the lipids oxidize. They certainly at two to eight at room temperature, they'll interact with an RNA. That's been published now. And you get these lipid RNA adducts. Obviously, that's not going to happen at minus 80. So there's a lot of kind of considerations you need to think about going forward. You may be driven by, you know, um, a need to have a two to eight degree formulation. That's going to be way more complex and a lot more stability studies are going to be required. You're going to be needing uh, to look at those excipients. Are they still there? Are they degrading? Are they interacting with your cargo? Whereas if, if you go minus 80, it, it's lower risk, but maybe the market isn't going to appreciate that. Maybe you won't be able to raise capital because people will say this isn't competitive other people now have liquid formulations. So a lot goes into figuring out where the direction you're gonna go and what risk and appetite you have with changes in those compositions. Yeah, we saw that concretely with the SM102 versus ALC0315 in the COVID experience where Moderna team, uh, who we know very well, Louis Prito, uh, was really leading that effort of the novel lipids. It wasn't just cytokines, it wasn't just immunogenicity, it wasn't just expression, it was actually stability. And that lipid was chosen for biodegradability, biocompatibility as compared to the early runners. And we saw clearly that, you know, Pfizer and BioNTech were unable, maybe they, if they had done studies and worked a little harder, but were unable to ever uh, store their vaccine at room temperature during the real uh, crisis and had to keep everything on dry ice. You saw on the news, people shoveling dry ice into the shipments coming into various places. And Moderna was able to get a four to six week stability profile. Now I think it's longer, but one of the rules of thumb, if you're just starting out, if you be really careful when you thaw, as Andy said, if you can freeze and it's very stable, but when you thaw, uh, if you don't put it back in the freezer, if you're doing experiments, uh, either make some new stuff or let it sit in the, at four degrees or so for, for a week or two to do your next immunization. But if you do a lot of freeze thaws and you don't know the formulation very well, 
This is all part of the engineering and, and industrialization of the, of the platform for clinic. If you don't know that and you're just screening, you know, try to avoid the, the free stall is one of the worst things that can happen to these, these formulations. And remember, it, RNA biologically is a transient messenger. It's supposed to be unstable. There are RNAs is everywhere. So this is really the, the drawback. If you do a LMP DNA, which people are doing, it's a whole different, whole different situation, right? A little bit different. There's still things that can go wrong, but the RNA itself is just inherently unstable. So you, the LMP's major role is to protect it from degradation. No, I think this points out maybe uh, some just sort of real aspects of where this technology is, you know, uh, in its uh, phase of development. And, you know, it is not a an oral, solid oral dosage pill, you know, that can sit on the shelf for uh, maybe months or years, you know, I mean, that is a limitation. And as was discussed, there are certain applications, rare disease, some cancers, you know, or extraordinary situations, a pandemic where you actually minus 20 or minus 80 freeze the thing <clears throat> where, you know, people have found use for this. But, um, <clears throat> but in, in terms of the next, a, a next potential alternative future for this technology is exactly in these areas is to turn these things into uh, room temperature stable uh, situ uh, formulations, two to eight stable. And then you open up a whole number of different applications that uh, are, are just kind of not there right now. And and so, so this is where the, the call it the CMC piece kind of comes in. And, and we're starting to see that. We're starting to see some formulations in advanced clinical that are freeze dry, for example, and stuff. But yeah, that, that will continue. Pfizer is trying that right now for their shing shingles vaccine, their VZD. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the, that's that is sort yeah. of um, sort of a new frontier uh, to move this beyond these very. Uh, niche kind of, or niche. I mean, obviously a pandemic is not niche, but it is a specialized situation where people will accept something in a format that they probably wouldn't uh, accept, you know, in a more competitive, different kind of uh, situation. So so I think those are opportunities for us. And uh, just sort of to show you that we're not at the end of the road for this technology and its applications. A couple of good segues there. Uh, I think Maybe that's a good one to, to sort of jump into the next topic, which is on scale up. Uh, and uh, so I guess just to start us off, what are some of the general key considerations when you're scaling these formulations up and what are the, some of the pitfalls people should look out for? What we're going through right now is actually scale of the ionizable lipid, which is the most complex aspect of it. Uh, the RNA is very digital. <laughs> so there's, there's a few things that you have to keep an eye on, but uh, when it comes to the, the ionizable lipid, it's really, can you find uh, how many steps, right? What's the, what's the purity level? How many steps is the synthesis? What's the purity level? And can, how long does it take to make for, to get to a phase one trial or your pre-tox? So you have GMP material going in. That's that's our biggest concerns. Is really you, you look at that ionizable lipid. If you think it's a good formulation, then you then you, you simultaneously you're looking at the chemistry behind it and cost of goods questions like that going forward. But um, that's where we are on 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 in, in that place. And it's really and finding a, you know a GMP manufacturer that can make this make something for you in a reasonable amount of time. I don't know what you're dealing with, Andy, but yeah, I mean scale up. Shall we think about unit operations? And for making an LMP, there are three. You, you, you've got the mixing technology. You could go with a PNI, you know, uh, nano assembler uh, type approach where you're using microfluidics, or you could now has a jet impinger system. You know, so you've got to pick your pick your mixing process. There's definitely more than one out there. The reason I like uh, the precision system is the bench top, the ignite. We can it scales all the way through to GMP. Uh, I'm a customer. We've used it and, and it works. It's rapid, uh, but absolutely you don't have to use that. Unit operation number two is tangential flow filtration. You've got to get rid of the ethanol. You've got to then get it into whatever buffer you're looking for for that final product. Uh, you know, usually for us, self-replicating RNA. Our largest, our largest cargo is 16 KB. We need a cryo buffer. We're frozen down at minus 80. So you've got to do a buffer exchange. You've got to then get it at the concentration you want it in the vial. And obviously, the particle's got to survive that process. And there's a bit of optimization that has to happen in there. The field has been dealing with 
tangential flow filtration, liposomal type formulations. Uh, there's a lot of advice that you can get out there from the companies that produce those TFF hollow fiber and flat sheet systems. They have a lot of experience now, particularly with the COVID scale up. Uh, and then the final unit operation is sterile filtration. In my experience, completely ignored. It'll always work. Absolutely not the case. Uh, you need to spend as much time there as you do on the others. And I would point people to a publication that came out in uh, 2020 uh, from Moderna, uh, pressure dependent fouling behavior during sterile filtration of mRNA containing lipid nanoparticles. It's in biotechnology and bioengineering. And there, there was an academic group that got supplied a co the COVID vaccine formulation in bulk. And they went in with a, a you know, a, a commercial um, uh, filtration system and did experiments. And what they found is that they had pressure dependent fouling. And, and the higher the pressure, the less fouling, which is kind of counterintuitive. And so, you know, you need to have your analytics in place and you need to be looking through the unit operations, what's happening not only to the particle, but the composition as well, because the FDA is going to be interested in, uh, you know, where it, how scalable is your process? Are you losing RNA? Are you, is the RNA hydrolyzing, degrading during the process? Or what's happening to the lipids? Are you losing lipids through the process? Is it scalable? Can you match what you made at the small scale, maybe at the GLP tox versus the clinical batch? And so you need the analytical packages in place but you need to look at all the unit operations and understand what's happening in each one. Do not ignore the last one, the sterile filtration. I have lost weeks of my life through my entire <laughs> career with DNA, siRNA, mRNA on ignoring that sterile filtration. I don't know, Mark, if you have a, a comment there too. Yes. <laughs> it's yeah, so true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, you know, yeah, yes, absolutely true that um, I think you can't take these things for granted. Keep in mind, these particles are surface active, right? And they are, they're not hard billiard balls. They're, they're designed to interact with membrane. They're just, they have flexibility and mobility. That's why they work so well. But on the flip side of that, when they're being squeezed through membranes or you know going along tubes and stuff um, under some flow, um, you know things can happen. And I think you just got to keep that in mind. And things do happen in the filling step and the uh, TFF steps. And and it's always good to you know have your own internal expert uh, you know there to sort of ask the CMOs to to uh, sort of make sure that uh, everything is uh, asked the right questions and and also for on the CMO side to, to bring that kind of experience to the table uh, for the customer because it matters. And, you know, some different RNAs are maybe more sensitive to uh, some of these things than others and that catch, catches people uh, off guard from time to time. So yeah, know, know thy product, know thy process, you know. Uh, that's 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 pretty pretty critical. The other little thing is, you know, is this point about aseptic versus terminal? You know, you, you know, sometimes I get questions asked. Go, oh, what if we had a you know like a 200 nanometer particle or 180 nanometer particle, uh, you know, something like that? And I go, well, you could, but all of a sudden you've changed your process dramatically because that cannot go through a 0.2 micron filter that well. So having these, keeping and maintaining these smaller particle sizes, maintaining the distribution so you don't have chunkies in there that are a little bit larger, all these things will help you, um, you know, uh, in terms of make, you know, making that process work better and appreciate that they can happen, um, you know, can is also an important thing. To, so you keep an eye out for those things. And perhaps related to... And they to... also, by the way, they happen when you least want them to happen. That's the other thing. You're making a critical batch. What's that? You know, or something like that. So, so that's the other thing is, is be prepared for these things before, and that's sort of a lesson learned, before they, uh, and ask these questions before you're making that critical uh, tox or clinical batch. Yeah, yeah I mean, good. probably the biggest piece of advice I could give to people is you can never have enough RNA. You know, you will, 
always have some in your back pocket just in case the batch goes down. As some, Mark says, something happens that you, you, you don't then have to wait four months to have another batch made at scale. Or, always make more than you need just in case. And we even built, Andy's uh, office is RNA spray, yeah. you know, by the way. <laughs> we, we, we built redundancy into the personalized cancer vaccine process. So you always had lots of backup, maybe five plasma preps simultaneously just in case something failed. So you could just keep going, things like that. So it's it's very it's it it it's been shown, like I said, uh, they just released Moderna just released some data on the personalized cancer vaccine. Obviously, the efficacy is looking really promising, but the fact that 90% of patients that enrolled got their vaccine. Uh, at the time limit of about 30 to 45 days is pretty impressive for being able to take any sequence, uh, put it in the middle of your gene of interest or antigen of interest with your flanking sequences around it, get it into an LNP, get it back to the patient. 90% uh, patients got their vaccine. So that, that was actually a, a big question mark when we started. That was the biggest question mark. So it's doable, but you really, it's, a, it's an engineering question and you have to stay in front of it. So we keep saying how easy it is. Look at the COVID, billions and billions of doses delivered, generated, manufactured. But this was years, decades of thinking and, 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 and optimizing process, um, et cetera. So if you're in the early screening stage, Phase appropriate specifications and questions, but still, it's it's a delicate it's a delicate biologic. And I think uh, many of you uh, alluded to sort of questions of yield in this process, right? Uh, and probably somewhat related to that is a question uh, from the audience uh, about the fraction of empty LMPs versus those that are that contain a, a nucleic acid. Uh, what are your thoughts on you know how to control that, or, or whether that's this issue? Uh, in this process? Uh, probably I would want to start with that. And uh, what uh, we can say is that a good manufacturing process can eliminate this, right? So uh, you could actually have a really, um, really uh, well encapsulated lipid nanoparticle that do not have that much of uh, the empty nanoparticle. And you would be able to use uh, different analytics uh, to kind of actually understand these particles. I think that probably this uh, uh, this concept have, might have been originated from actually, uh, you know, when people are doing like uh, hands-on techniques in the lab, their own make manufacturing techniques, uh, custom-made formulation uh, boxes. Um, so probably this, you know, this might have originated from there and also maybe from the AAVs where we kind of again talk about, um, you know, MT versus, uh, you know, the uh, the full cap set. Um, so I would say the new analytics like such as nano FCM and other particle tracking analyzers can be used to detect if it's needed and a good manufacturing technique can actually ease out this problem to begin with. So think in terms of that uh, quality by design, right? Like, um, is it necessary that you have to think about actually purifying later on or would you want to consider actually from the start, uh, you know, optimizing your process such a way that uh, you will have have actually complete encapsulation efficiency, you, your payload is all completely protected and you do not have MD, uh, LNPs, yeah. I'd be really interested in Mark, Mark's perspective here because this is shall I, like a phase appropriate question. What, what you can get away with at phase one is not what you can get away with uh, at, at a commercial process. And so he must have seen this with on Patro as they scale. It, at what point, Mark, did the, the FDA start asking questions about empty versus full? And, and you know, what, what was the dialogue like as you moved along? Well, it comes up, you know, it does come up. Um, and, you know, I think, yeah, I would say early phase, it generally is, um, you know, what's the rationale to support uh, that, you know, that you would have or would not expect to see that. Um, actually, in that particular case, as I recall, a long time ago now, was that actually some experiments were done to, uh, to look into it, you know, uh, in response to a regulatory question. Um, so be prepared if it comes up to be able to sort of address it. Um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't think it would to, to fundamentally the way these are mixed 
it's unlikely, right? So, um, so I think you've got the science, the process science at your back to Anita's point. Um, and, but, but, but be prepared to, you know, answer questions in the, in, in any questions that could come up in the, in a scientifically uh, appropriate way, keeping in mind, you know, that, it, it, you know, that it, these, these, I think this is not expected to be, I mean, the way, the way it, the way it manifests itself would be potentially as a tox issue, frankly, right. and as a batch to batch, potentially as a batch right. to batch reproducibility <laughs> issue. Um, so I think you can address it in that context. You can address it in the chemical, in the process uh, physics context, and yeah. you know perhaps in the, in the analytical context if you absolutely need to and want to tick and tie everything. And like you said, the reproducibility or whatever your potency assay is, whether it's yeah. in vitro, uh, but basically you have a potency assay and you say, well, yeah, I have some variation in the spec, but it doesn't impact my potency assay. Uh, that's, that's a way to look at it. And like you said, from the regulator's perspective, it's really more about batch to batch consistency and definitely safety, right? So if there's a question about that, uh, then there's somebody there, or multiple people that are thinking that this could be a safety issue. One of the ways to counter that is to, you know, basically rationally argue and find literature to say there is no safety issue. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's more of a batch to batch. If I have much less, a lot of empty LMP, that means I don't have very good encapsulation, most likely. Right. If I'm using the exact same process. So there's sort of a logic argument to make. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we learned. Uh, just recently that we're still processing, you know, how, you know, because the specifications will uh, for for internally for us, as well as for the FDA and other regulators around the world, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to increase. So the amount of uh, oversight as to, you know, making this correctly uh, is going to increase. I saw this with CAR-19 T cells as well, right? So the beginning, I'm sure it's going to happen with the personalized cancer vaccine as well. We were able to get away with a lot of squishy. And that's normal. Well, that's yeah, a, a function of a growing technology uh, platform, right? I mean, the analytics will, they're already starting as, as Anita and other panelists mentioned, they're, they're already, we're already starting to see different methods. I mean, 10 years ago, it was the slab gel, right? I mean, you know, um, so we're moved, we've moved away from that and um, for RNA characterization and these these techniques are getting better. Um, the, we still have a the, doctor for double RNA. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's yeah. the block for double stranded RNA, which is the regulator, you know, the gold standard for the regulator, regulatory industry, which is kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think, yeah, I think just being aware that you know that's part of developing a technology is that these will become better, methods will get better. Um, some of these questions that we have may eventually go away, frankly, um, as people understand it and have experience with the uh, the impacts and. Another question? Yeah, uh, so I guess uh, one of the questions that comes up is uh, how, do, how do your preparations in earlier stages help you in uh, sort of overcoming some of the challenges when you scale up? So what can you do earlier on to, to really accelerate your, your development of this process? I think Andy kind of covered that earlier in a way, and I said the same thing. I mean, you really start developing early, and and the idea of you know um, you know first you pick your your ionizable lipid if you're focusing on the LMP, uh, and that has to do with you know the earliest stages of IP, and um, definitely uh, you know how easy is it to make and what kind of uh, ADME byproducts you can have from that, because that's really going to be your novel chemical matter, unless you go with something that's already known. Uh, then if you uh, make your formulations, I think you guys explained many, many times. I, but to screen first, I think we talked about that earlier too, that you have a biological assay. If you like what you're seeing, you should have more than one hit if you have enough lipids to screen and formulations to screen. Uh, if you like what you're seeing, then you go deep into all the bioanalytics and, and, and biochemical and biophysical uh, stability, you know, force degradation questions. We do a yeah. lot. I mean, you know, anybody yeah, have to... yeah, Shell, I'd, I'd say you, you got to be careful. So, you know, when you're filing that IND, you know, for the phase one material, you know, the, the first question that the regulator is probably going to ask is the material that went into the safety talks, how does it compare to the GMP batch that you've made that you want to dose humans? Are they the same? And, you know, so they're going to go with a level of scrutiny through the analytical panels and go, are they the same? Tick, tick, tick. 
So you tick all of those boxes, but then they're going to ask the question, how, does the, how do those materials compare to the preclinical materials that you tested in the preclinical models to generate the data that's supporting the IND? And, and so if they're different, that raises a whole level of regulatory questions about, you know, that you may not want to do. So you, you've got to try and maintain your, your formulations right from the beginning. What you tested preclinically, GLP tox, GMP, and then you're going to have to try and scale. There'll be changes you make, but you'll have to justify as you scale that those changes haven't impacted uh, you know, the, the, the formulation in any dramatic way. And you may have to go back and do some testing in vivo to show comparability. But sure. it is critical to maintain all the way through the process, even early on. And one of the reasons I love, you know, that the PNI system is that Ignite scales. You know, they 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 have this chip architecture now where you can modulate the flow rates, change the dimensions, and you know you can make formulations at a 200 mil scale versus a 12 mil scale, and, and it's the same stuff. And so we've seen that over our two-year accelerated program. We look back historically at the preclinical formulations made on the Ignite versus the GMP. They're, they're the same. Yeah, I think that's a perfect segue into the next topic, uh, our fourth and final topic here, which is some of the regulatory considerations. And there's already a bunch of questions that have been uh, sort of uh, spurred on uh, here in the questions. So one of these is um, about the uh, current requirements for uh, lipid formulations. Is it necessary for your um, lipid components to be biodegradable uh, in order to be accepted, uh, or is, is there uh, some leeway there? You know, the, on the material side, it's it's your risk. I mean, if that's if that's what you select and that's your product, and you establish the uh, you know the safety. Uh, you know, the proper safety uh, window through your GLP talks, then, um, you know, it's sort of, and, and, you know, there's questions as was, as, as was mentioned, there'll, there'll be questions. How long does that last? How long does the lipids, lipid particle last? And it may, re, you know, there may be reasons or you might actually be required to do some studies to look into that probably will. So there are studies and that will perhaps that wouldn't occur if it degraded faster. You might have to do, but ultimately, it's your it's your risk, and you need to have a have a package that. If you, if you would choose safety. something that would, yeah, if you would choose something that was non biodegradable, I would hope there would be a biological rationale for your disease target patient population as to why that is, because it's always better to have something biodegradable that still does what it needs to do. If it, if you're doing a you know if you're in the vaccine space and you want to do a prophylactic vaccine. Uh, you, you really almost have to have it to be, be biodegradable or show that the material that doesn't degrade is excreted like very quickly, et cetera. Otherwise, yeah, it, it's too much risk uh, and unknown for the amount of benefit you could get from other technologies that we know will work, including recombinant protein plus adjuvant. Uh, right? So you just go back, or even recombinant protein without a, any kind of fancy adjuvant uh, that could work in, in vaccines work in certain situations there. So that would always be the regulatory question, you know, what is your rationale for doing something that is considered increasing the, you know, the, the risk over the benefit? And you say, well, my benefit is going to be to cure this subset of, you know, rare diseases. And this is the only way I believe we can do that. And we have supporting data that it makes sense. Otherwise, I would shy away from anything where there's already proof of concept, you know, from Al Nylum, from, from Moderna, from BioNTech, from many other companies now, and other, and the FDA is very familiar with a lot of clinical trials, phase one, two, three, going on all the time right now, that, you know, shy away from anything that's outside of the standard scope, if you want it, if you want to move quickly, unless, like I said, there's a strong scientific biological rationale why you would, why you would do a non-biodegradable. And there's a question in the in the question panel here about uh, half lives of materials. Are, are we characterizing the half life of you know the LMP in the bloodstream, or how about the half lives of the uh, the drug substance as well as you know the various lipid components? Uh, how important are each of these these considerations? 
Yeah, it looks like, you know, certainly from the FDA's perspective, they're more interested, if it's a biodegradable lipid with, you know, some endogenous lipids in there, they're more interested in where's the cargo going and how long is it lasting for. So those are kind of the first biodistribution studies they're asking early on. But there's no doubt that as you progress through the development pipeline, they're going to want to know what's happening to the lipids too. But early on, they're focused on the cargo. And, you know, as Nick's highlighted, they're starting to view the LMPs more as excipients, uh, as long as you have the appropriate, uh, you know, tox data to support um, taking them forward. Yeah, and a lot of screening, like I said, I mean, I said this in the, uh, at the beginning, but I've never seen any overt toxicity in animals. I mean, occasionally a mouse will die, but that happens in all kinds of studies, but, you know, one out of a thousand uh, kind of things. And uh, genotox, reprotox, I've never heard of anything where you take these lipids and you run them through the gamut of sort of the, 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 the tox package that you would need for novel chemical matter. And I've never seen, I mean, maybe you guys have, but I've never seen anything that is overtly toxic or you find one, you know, class or whatever. And I think the FDA and other regulators around the world are starting to understand this, right? So I think, like I said, if you stick to the, if you want to make vaccines or, or drugs and you stick to the, what, what's known and accepted by the regulators, you're in much better shape. Unless, like I said, you can't because your target or your biology dictates that you have to go off. But right now, I think the RNA itself has been, a lot of things have been learned through the COVID experience as well. And now we have the LMP side uh, where that's all being quite uh, well understood. And I think we're going to have a much more, if you go to regulators around the world, you're going to have a much uh, uh, better experience than say in the earliest days when, when this all started. Uh, there's a good understanding that this is a, you know, one of the advantages is it's plug and play, right? So you can get your platform, you lock everything, and then you just keep swapping out your gene of interest or antigen of interest. And they should be, you should be like, everything else should be fine. I do a quick you know, one species tox study and vaccines, we do what's called an N plus one. So if I'm going to give two injections, I give three uh, to the animal, but you do rat, you don't have to do primates anymore. And that that should pass. Once you have a few, some human data and you've already been through the process, it, it should become very, very straightforward. Yeah, a couple things to just to comment partially on that is that vaccines and do dose matters, route matters, application yeah. matters. And so I think, you know, it would be remiss not to point that out. And so I think whenever you hear any of us say anything, keep in mind that there's an typically an application and a use and a dose assumption behind that. And just that's important in the context of what when when you consider what you're developing. Um, you know, it's very important to keep those things in mind. That's a very good point. And I feel like uh oftentimes we're we're sort of assuming vaccine in a lot of cases simply because that's the the one that we well, have yeah, I, 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 it's, <laughs> that that's true i mean again you're going to get a, a strong opinion again it's given intramuscularly it's a low dose compared to chronic delivery and it's punctated so there's spacing between the doses so it's not chronic systemic and i went through this a lot when i worked on small molecule adjuvants so it's a different different game than doing small molecule drug uh, delivery orally etc uh things like that so uh, but basically uh, there is a, I think there might be a bias on this panel with Andy and me. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice I mean, uh, it, it, you know, it's the biggest success, I would say, and along with the alnylam uh, work in the SI, I think the protein replacement is, is, is still lagging like a lot of other gene therapy. But, you know, you know, for those listening, you know, those early clinical trials in vaccines are fairly straightforward. But, you know, if you're taking a prophylactic vaccine into a healthy population, you're age de-escalating down into infants, that means your phase two and phase three is going to be massively large because it's all about safety. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and you know, it, that's why you won't see many small biotechs developing a prophylactic vaccine uh, for RSV age de-escalating into infants it, because it is a very, very expensive game to play. Um, and only the big biotech, big farmers can do it uh, because it's all about safety. Yeah. The phase three is like 80,000 volunteers. Yeah. And they have to be followed for multiple years. 20, 30, yeah, until they die. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a huge expense in, in that in that area. The, the therapeutic is a is a better area. Now we have some success. Actually, Shingrix is a therapeutic vaccine, which you know, highly highly successful. And, and maybe this is a naive question for me, but uh, you know, 
what do we need to get to a, a situation where many of these excipients or or even the RNA are generally accepted as safe and uh, you know this and would ultimately sort of accelerate a lot of these uh, approvals. Yeah, and Mark, you take this. You're saying uh, gra when would it, a which one the lipid or the the lipid is that what you're referring to? Yeah, or either the lipid or, or the, the drug substance. Yeah, I think yeah. I think maybe both would need to be generally such a safe. I think we're kind of a ways away from that because if you look at what's on the on the grass list, you know, um, you know that I, I would actually probably recommend people look at the inactive ingredients guide as more of a benchmark rather than the term grass, because the inactive ingredients guide will, will include a variety of, of compounds, of in, inactive compounds and ranges and routes that they, they're using. It's a good reference tool to sort of benchmark whether you're using, a lip, for example, a lipid that's on that, or if you're in the range of a previous use, because that's a very powerful, argument in your in your um, overall assessment of CMC risk and tox risk and things like that. So I, I think I would probably mention that um, as opposed to the, the term grass per se as, a, as something that's kind of practically useful. And, and this applies if lipids are considered excipients, but uh, I think there's a question also in the in the chat here about whether LMPs or, or the perhaps the ionizable lipid would ever be considered an API and what challenge that would oppose or pose to uh, the regulatory process. Let, let me let me take that because we went through this with adjuvants for many years. So vaccine adjuvants are critical to making sometimes a vaccine that you couldn't possibly make because you need more potency uh, just with the antigen alone. But clearly the mechanism of action of vaccines, okay, is to induce memory and antigen specific B and T cells, right? Mostly B cells making antibodies is the mechanism of action. So there, anything else that isn't your antigen cannot be the API. It is just a helper. It is something that can increase uh, efficiency. It'd be like formulating any drug that the active, you know, a kinase inhibitor, but I formulated it now in a different way that can be considered novel uh, and it really, really makes it stronger and it could lead to side effects. We know that adjuvants and, and LMPs could lead to side effects in certain individuals, et cetera. But really, if you know what your target is and what you're, you know, what you're trying to do, I don't see, and we went through this, like I said, and it, it really is, a, a calling an excipient is kind of, kind of odd, even for an adjuvant or an LMP, but this is what the, I think we've settled on. And it sounds to me, and even regulators around the world, Chinese, uh, Europe uh, are really putting this in this bucket. It's kind of a catch-all. It's like, this is really important, but it isn't the API. And that's a good place for it, I think. And I, I logically, I mean, I helped to you know, frame uh, many, many discussions along with my colleagues and colleagues from other companies, you know, in discussions with the regulator, the FDA in particular, as to what do we do with these adjuvants? People are coming up with novel adjuvants every day. They, got, they had different mechanisms of action too. So unlike the LMP where the mechanism of action is quite quite um, uh, uniform. The different adjuvants were targeting different toll-like receptors, things that we didn't even know. Like We don't know what it does, but it just boots the immune response. And this idea of an excipient, you know, something added to enhance your API is, is a good way to look at it. And I, I think that's a good analogy. And I'd be happy to be challenged on that by the panel. Uh, but I think it's a really good place for the LMP in this space for both but, vaccines. But, yeah, the cell, you know, you can buy cholesterol USP. And yeah. the level of scrutiny of that it, for the regulators is going to be low. But if you come in with a novel excipient, the level of scrutiny is going to be higher. They're going to want to know how is it produced? How have you characterized it? What's its impurity profile look like? You know, it, is it, you know, animal component free? So there's a lot you have to do, even though it's just an excipient. And, and, and the level of scrutiny goes up if it's novel. So the ionizable lipid is novel. Maybe your DSPC isn't if it's in your lipid composition, but it's not USP. So that you're going to have to do some work to satisfy the regulator that it's appropriate and, and it's well characterized. So uh, a general question from uh from the question panel here is, uh, are there any tips and tricks for making IND filings go smoother? Pass the red face test. 
do a pre-IND. So the red face test is, do I believe this? And I'm willing to stick my neck out a little bit with the FDA and do a pre-IND and ask really uh, focused questions. Don't over for phase one in particular IND. Do not overdo it. See if you can sit down with the team for a very long time and experts and consultants and really think about what's the minimal viable package. Because they'll accept anything you say if it's over. Like if you're doing too much, not, sometimes they'll cut back on the animals in a talk study and say you don't need that many. Uh, this it, but mostly in my experience, it's really put on your regulator hat, pass the red space test scientifically. Like can't do it that way. It's just not going to work. I have to change something. So they have their standard protocols. And if you want to change anything, then you use the pre-IND. And now they have a tight D meeting. It doesn't seem to speed things up much, but you can ask like two questions pretty quickly and get feedback. So you have two key questions about your technology, et cetera. For, for, for what we do with the pre-IND, and I've done it in the past, is you put as much CMC data, because that's like 70% of your IND anyway, much CMC data as you have. You put tell them, if I don't have this data, it'll be in the IND, and this is exactly what we expect it to look like. You have your own specifications. Make sure your talks um, package is tight. If you think you might be asked for two species, Ask them specifically. We think this is our good tox factor into one species. So you save money and time, et cetera, things like that. And then your clinical trial design, a lot of times, is where you really get tripped up uh, in, in, in the process. So really think about now something standard like Andy and I are doing in our phase ones, sort of safety, tolerability, always for phase one, but also immunogenicity as a secondary endpoint, no efficacy, no, no fancy stuff uh, going on there at that stage. Uh, but your clinical trial design, if you're doing anything novel with combinations, really important to think about. So like I said, just lay out, like, there's really standard, if you think about, you know, a standard drug that you're just going to copy a biological mechanism, a platform, et cetera, uh, but you've got to meet better and something, then there's a standard package. And then if you're deviating from that standard package at all, you have novel chemical matter, then you really have to think hard because you can do way too much and spend way too much money and waste a lot of time. And they may be acceptable for a first in human, you know, even, even in, a, in a volunteer setting you know, uh, where you, for a vaccine, or if you're going into therapy, you know, cancer, you, you can have very, very uh, liberal uh, discussions, especially if it's a novel approach. And so really it's about really preparing early. And that's what we start doing. We start developing. As soon as we start talking about the vaccine, we're thinking about these questions. Like we're gonna be, what we're gonna go to the FDA and say, we, and we know it's always done this way, but we really can't. Kind of like the biodegradable versus non-biodegradable. You have a really strong scientific rationale. You start planning experiments to potentially back that up as to why. Uh, and like I said, if you promise to do, you know, primates, they may say sure. And you don't need to do primates, but if you said rats, they might have said sure. So it's, it's being strategic there. But pass the red face test. If you really believe you need primates for safety, then you should not try to squeeze it by them because they don't like that. And you really want to build a relationship. Because uh, the regulators, the people you're going to get are going to be overlapping. You're going to get similar people looking at your stuff. You have multiple candidates going in. Andy, you want to comment on that? Since you're yeah, no, the, right they, now. It, yeah, same. You know, I agree. You know, you can ask a lot of de-risking questions at that pre-IND. You know, the worst thing you can do is file your IND and the FDA then says, ah, well, we wanted you to do this for the safety talks. Whereas if you've got buy-in at that pre-IND meeting, they could still ask you to change things and redo it, but it's more likely that you're good to go. The other thing I'd say is keep the science there. You know, be scientific. If you've got data, put it in, explain your data, because ultimately they are scientists. It is all about early on, uh, you know, safety, 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 but they listen to science. And if you've got a good scientific rationale for the way and why you're doing things, put it in. But the pre-IND, if you're not familiar, if you aren't familiar, that's a really nice process. You've made a, a meeting request. You have about uh, 60 to 90 days to get your pre-IND in. Once you have your meeting request, it has to be in 30 days before the meeting. And then within 30 days of submitting, um, that, that's why it's within 30 days you have to submit. After 30 days, they have to schedule that meeting and then you get your feedback. So they have to review it under, this is actually uh, passed by Congress to speed up the process. <laughs> the same thing with the IND. But basically the pre-IND is, is, is a really uh, powerful approach. They even have now what's called a type B, which is a little more scaled back. I would prefer to just do the, the whole pre-ID. If you know what your manufacturer is going to look like, it's great to just put it all out there and say, here's all the USPs, here's our, here's how our specification is going to look. If you really know what that looks like, and here's my molecule. I always say with the with the IND, you, you say, tell the FDA, here's what it is. 
incredible detail. Here's how I make it, incredible detail. And then here's how I know I made it, right? <laughs> incredible detail. Then you say, this is how I know it's safe, right? Wrong, et cetera. And then this is how I'm going to test it in humans. And those are the three major sections. That's it. Yeah, and I would say, you know, don't, you gotta, you gotta make sure you cover all the bases all the way to the final thing you're gonna have to do is a compatibility study. So, you know, you, you, how, how are you gonna take your formulation? How are you gonna dose it to the patient? Are you gonna do a dilution? Are you gonna draw it up into a syringe? You're gonna have to satisfy the FDA that what's in that dosing going into patients is as advertised and, so you know it you got you got to go all the way down and, and understand the full process all the studies you've got to do because the last thing you got to do is get to the end and go oh we forgot about the compatibility study potency, at the end. Potency. yes that's your potency assay stuff like that so how do you know you made it and that's going to be in your your package going forward i think yeah. one of the, yeah one of the areas for sure that you can really trip up again is the clinical trial design and for LMP, to get back to the LMP RNA specifically, you know, freeze thaw, right? So you're probably in your first studies are going to go frozen, just like most small companies would if it's an IND, you know, uh, et cetera. So you go frozen and then you really want to show that when you thaw it at least once or twice. So when it's in the, you know, the pharmacy or whatever, that it, it maintains that stability. So there's questions that are specific for each technology, but then there's a general sort of de-risking that, that occurs. So we are at time, gentlemen, and uh, Anita. Uh, I will uh, maybe just wrap up by first thanking all of you for joining us for this panel. Uh, it was great to have all of uh, all of our panelists here, and thank you to the audience for uh, tuning in and asking your questions. Uh, I just want to remind people that there's a survey coming up at the end of uh, the uh, the webinar here uh, that I hope you guys will fill out. And we will make the recording available, but uh, also please do uh, send us your questions afterwards. Um, email us your questions if you have any additional questions. We have a, a list of questions here that are you know, backlogged in the in our question panel here. Uh, but with that, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. I appreciate all of that. And uh, we'll see you next time for the next uh, seminar slash uh, panel. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.